Hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. Uh, welcome to the second day of All Things Open. I hope you're enjoying your time here. I know there's a, a little bit of virtual fatigue. I'm definitely aware of it. So it's, it's kind of nice to be able to be here live and to be able to speak to all of you. I can't see your faces, unfortunately, but I'm hoping in the future that maybe we'll cross paths at some point. Anyway, today, at least I'm here live virtually, and uh, welcome to this talk on unpacking the container. I'm pretty excited to share with you today some things that I've learned about containers in my own experience. Um, and of course, they are still all of their age right now. So an important topic to get your head wrapped around if you haven't yet. Um, my hope is that you come away today with a better understanding of the history behind containers, how they actually work on your system, and some of what is really going on under the covers. Um, my idea here is that if you really understand how something works underneath, you will be able to use it better and more efficiently. So that's my goal for you today. Um, the slides that I have for you and additional information about this talk will be available on jfrog.com show notes. I've got a link here on this slide. Um, I am available on Twitter. You can DM me with questions. Um, and uh, I also, before we go any further, have um, some swag to offer you. Um, if you go to this bit.ly link, you have a chance to win a Star Wars Lego set. I was really disappointed uh, when I found out that I couldn't enter because I don't have the Millennium Falcon yet. And um, this is a really cool one. So don't miss out on that. Uh, take a screenshot, take a picture of your phone, get this link, folks. All right, uh, next, just a little bit about me and my background. Um, I'm Melissa McKay. I started with JFrog as a developer advocate in February of this year. So right just right before everything shut down and we weren't doing live conferences anymore. Um, before that, I was a developer. I've been a developer for over 20 years. And uh, most of my experience has been in server-side development and Java, but I've had the privilege of working on many different uh, teams over the years in a variety of different languages, different tool sets, different technologies. I've been on large teams, small teams, big companies, small companies, Definitely had my share of frustrations and successes, as many of you, I'm sure. And uh, along the way, I discovered that I really like to speak. That was something that I did for a while in my spare time. And um, it's, it's work. It's a lot of research and time to put aside. So I reached out looking for an opportunity to do this full time. And the opportunity with JFrog came up. So here I am today. All right. Let's get started. Um, first, we'll begin with a brief history to give you some background context. Hopefully this part won't be too boring, but there's some really important milestones in the past that are important to know about containers and how we got here today. Then we'll take a look at the container market, what's been going on there over the last few years. Then we'll get into a real understanding of what Docker actually is. And uh, note that Docker is not synonymous with containers. It's a different thing. After that, we'll be in an excellent place to talk about what a container actually is. Then we'll review a few gotchas. These are things that I fell into um, in my experience when I first started. Um, then we'll, uh, I'll give you some ideas on how to manage your container images. That's pretty important too. And then last but, not, last but not least, I'll um, point you to, um, I'll, I'll reshare the link so that you can get your Lego set. So without further ado, let's jump in and start learning about containers. So um, I've given this talk a few times now and it's, it's kind of fun. Um, you're probably wondering right away if you're in the right place because this is not the picture that you would expect in a container talk. Uh, it's not a shipping container. There's a couple reasons that I chose bananas, and uh, that's the theme of this talk. Um, there's uh, a, a couple reasons. First and foremost, I'm just tired of seeing shipping containers in every presentation, anything about Docker or containerization in general. So I started a, a bit of a rebellion, and I challenge all speakers, find something else. Find something else other than a shipping container. Um, second, uh, this is actually really a story about how our industry has adapted to dealing with limited resources. And Bananas reminded me of a story that my grandfather would tell me 
when I was growing up. Um, he grew up in the, the late 20s, early 30s. And back then he would get a banana once a year. And uh, he and his siblings would take that one banana and they would scrape the banana from the banana peel to get as much as they could off there because you know it was a limited resources or limited resource. They wouldn't be getting another one till the following year. So it might not be the best analogy, but I liken that story to how computing resources were in the 1960s and 70s. They were very limited and very expensive. On top of that, it took forever to get any, anything done. And often a computer would be dedicated for a long period of time to a single task for a single user. Obviously, the limits on time and resources created bottlenecks and inefficiency. And just being able to share was not enough. There needed to be a method to share without getting in each other's way and without having one person inadvertently causing an entire system crash for everyone. So the need for better strategies in sharing compute resources actually started a path of innovation that we see massive benefits from today. There are some key points in time that brought us to the state that we are in today with containers. And I'm going to begin our container history lesson with Chirut or CH root or change root, however you want to pronounce it. Chirut was born in 1979 during the development of the seventh edition of Unix and was added to BSD in 1982. Being able to change the apparent root directory for a process and its children results in a bit of isolation in order to provide an environment, for example, testing a different distribution. Chirut was a great idea. It solved a specific problem, but more was needed. The jail command was introduced by FreeBSD in 2000. Jail is a little more sophisticated than Chirut in that it includes additional features to help with further isolation of file systems, users and networks with the ability to assign an IP address to each jail. In 2004, Solaris Zones brought us ahead even further by giving an application full user process and file system space and access to system hardware. Solaris Zones also introduced the idea of being able to snapshot a file system. You'll see the importance of that later. In 2006, Google jumped in with their process containers. These were later renamed C, renamed C groups, which centered around isolating and limiting the resource usage of a process. Moving right along, in 2008, C groups were merged into the Linux kernel, which along with Linux namespaces led to IBM's development of Linux containers. And then 2013 was a big year. This is when Docker came on the scene, bringing their ability to package containers and move them from one environment to another. That same year, Google open sourced their Let Me Container That For You project. That provided applications the ability to create and manage their own subcontainers. From here, we see the use of containers and Docker specifically just explode. In 2014, Docker chose to swap out their use of the LXC toolset for launching containers with libcontainer in order to utilize a native Golang solution. That was something new for me that um, they use Golang. I'm almost done with this history lesson, but um, before we move on, uh, there is another event. <laughs> June 2015. This is important to know about because it'll give you some insight into some of the activity and the motivations behind shifts in the market. The Open Container in Initiative was established. This is an organization under the Linux Foundation that includes members from many major stakeholders, which includes Docker, with the goal of creating open standards for container runtimes and image specification. We'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. While all of this is happening in the container world, there are a couple of other dates that are going to be important to Java devs specifically. Since my background was a lot in Java, this was important to me. 
uh, Java 7 was released in July of 2011. Notice this is before Docker came on the scene and before a lot of this work um, with containers was you know, available to the public. Work was started on Java 8, which was released in March of 2014. So keep this in mind, because when you start containerizing your Java applications, this little bit of history will be important to know. All right, that's it for our history lesson. Let's move on to what's been going on in the market with containers. I did a little hunting. I found that for the last three years, Sysdig, a company that provides a really powerful monitoring and troubleshooting tool for Linux, a lot of you might already be familiar with this product, uh, they put out a container report based on the analysis of their own users. Part of the report includes data on container runtimes that are in use. In 2017, they analyzed data from 45,000 containers. There's no graph available for that one because 99% of those containers were Docker, so they didn't bother to split up the results. In 2018, it became more apparent that that would be interesting data to show. Uh, they analyzed twice as many containers, 90,000. It still doesn't seem like that many, but um, in 83% of those were Docker, 12% were CoreOS Rocket containers, 4% Mesos containerization, or containerizer, sorry, and 1% LXE. So it looks like there, at this point, other container runtimes are starting to encroach a little bit on Docker. Moving to 2019, the latest Sysdig container report included stats from over 2 million containers. Now we're talking. This is some real data here. Docker is still holding relatively strong at 79%. 18% is Containerd. Um, it's worth noting that Containerd is actually a runtime that Docker builds on top of. The last 4% is Cryo. I don't know that there's enough data here to determine whether Docker will stay on top in the future or if something completely different will prevail. That remains to be seen. But this data is interesting, especially because of what's been happening over the last few years. Um, another thing to note here, and it's kind of a sad story, uh, notice that Rocket, CoreOS Rocket containers disappeared at this point from the graph. Uh, CoreOS was acquired by Red Hat at the beginning of 2018. Um, prior to that, Rocket was accepted to the CNCF as an incubating project and looked like a promising competitor to Docker's Containerd. However, since that acquisition, the development of the project went dormant. And in mid-2019, Rocket was archived by the CNCF. In February 2020, this year, the project was ended. Now that I've introduced a few of these other container runtimes, uh, that exist out there besides Docker, it's time to start talking about what a container actually is and what Docker actually provides in order to appreciate the differences between them. So what exactly is Docker anyway? This is key. What Docker had over the other players in the container game was a focus on commoditizing a complete solution that made it easy for developers to package and deploy their applications. Once containers became easy to use, we all witnessed that explosion of tools and resources around containers, and the Docker image format rose to become a de facto standard in the market. The stats that I showed from Sysdig are specific to container runtimes. That terminology is important to understand here. I'll explain the pieces and parts involved in working with containers, and you'll immediately understand why Docker sucked up the market so fast. As users, let's think about what we actually need to get our apps up and running out there. Every innovation that is coming out of this space is purely based on uh, users' needs and wants Whatever the motivation behind it, if you've got those motivations um, bad enough, there's a huge opportunity there for solution providers. Uh, that's a common sense thing, uh, maybe not worth saying, but so often we find ourselves getting so far down into the nitty gritty details that we lose sight of the actual problem we are trying to solve. And this leads to a ton of missed and overlooked opportunities. So here's a list of needs that are broken up into discrete features. First and foremost, we need that container itself. Some of you might be asking about virtual machines at this point. 
uh, discussing VMs is out of the scope of this session, so I'm not going to go deep into the differences between VMs and containers or why you would use one over the other. Uh, the one thing I will say is that a virtual machine is not synonymous with a container. The biggest difference being that a VM actually includes an entire OS all to itself. Containers share the system's OS. The point of the container is to be lightweight and have the ability to move from one environment to another seamlessly and quickly. That tends to be the biggest difference between containers and VMs. That said, I know there's a, a ton of developments going on right now in the VM space, but that's a topic for another time. So the rest of this list. We need an image format to define a container. We need a way to build an image of a container. We need a way to manage images. We need a way to distribute and share our images with our teams or externally. We need a way to create, launch, and run a container environment. And we need a way to manage the life cycle of the running containers. I didn't even get into orchestration or anything, but this is plenty to, to prove my point about Docker. So Docker was ready with an answer for everything. Um, you want to start using containers? Well, here's Docker engine, use Docker engine. You need an image format? Well, here's a, a Docker image format all ready for you. You need a way to build an image? Well, just create a Docker file and call Docker build. You want to manage images? Sure, um, call Docker images or uh, Docker RM for removing images. You want to share your images or use an image from someone else? Call Docker push or Docker pull. Oh, and there's Docker hub where you can store and share your images with you know, external teams. You need a way to launch, run, and manage your containers in their life cycle? We'll call Docker run, Docker stop, or Docker PS. Docker succeeded in quickly meeting the immediate needs of a container hungry market. On top of that, the tool sets that Docker provided made it really easy for developers. It was enough to walk away with a tremendous part of the market share all the way down the aisle. I hope you appreciate this banana picture. Took a while to find something that was uh, relatable. <laughs> Remember in our history lesson, when I spoke about the open container initiative, out of all of those features that we just discussed that Docker offers you, there are two that were taken up for the cause by the OCI, the image format and the container runtime. This is again, more of this terminology around containers. Docker did quite a bit of reorganizing their code base. They developed some extractions, um, pulling out discrete functionality, um, they are a heavy contributor to the OCI, and they gave Docker v2 image spec as a basis for the OCI image spec and run C, which was contributed as a reference implementation of the OCI runtime spec. There are quite a few other container runtimes you might see out there, including container D, Rocket, which we've discussed, Cryo, and Kata, all with various levels of features for specific use cases. It's worth pointing out that, um, again, container D was actually contributed by Docker to the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and internally uses run C. Uh, container D has also been integrated into the latest versions of Docker. It's actually been in use since uh, version 1.11, which came out in 2016. So it's, it's been around a while now. The next few years will be interesting to observe what happens with these specs and how the OCI moves forward with this. There's quite a range of differing opinions about what should and should not be in the standard for a container runtime. We're in a situation where using a runtime that only meets the requirements of the OCI spec doesn't seem to be enough, um, clearly by the use of the full, full Docker ecosystem. I've added a, a couple links here that are excellent starting places to learn more about container runtimes, if you're curious. Uh, again, these slides will be made available later and um, after, the, after the conference as well. <laughs>
The second one is uh, the beginning of a blog series by Ian Lewis, who is a, a Google Dev Advocate. The first subtitle in that blog is, is literally why are container runtimes so confusing? And I read that and uh, immediately agreed, yes, you know, why is that? Anyway, Ian does a really good job of succinctly explaining some of this. Now that we understand all that Docker entails and some of what's going on in the market, let's focus on just the container itself and what that actually looks like on your system. I'll show you how it's stored and what's actually happening under the covers. And you'll discover pretty quickly that images and containers aren't really all that magical. My first experience with containers was as a new developer on a project with a tight deadline. Of course, I, I think many, maybe all <laughs> software projects have tight deadlines. Um, I could argue, uh, yeah, that describes most projects. The best course of action for me usually is to just jump in, get started, getting something up and, and running on my local system. I learn best by doing. Um, the Docker documentation is actually really good for this. So if you find yourself in a similar position, start with their getting started docs. I've linked those here on this slide. Going through that guide will help you get comfortable with some of the Docker commands you're going to need. Um, the first thing to note is that a Docker image is really just a tarball of a complete file system. Uh, remember in our history lesson when I talked about the ability to snapshot a file system? That's what this is. When an image is unpacked, it's actually just thrown into its own directory, which becomes its root file system. The second is that processes that are involved in running the containers are just regular Linux processes. On top of that, there are just a few Linux features that are used together in a way to achieve the isolation that we want from containers. Namespaces are one of those. That's an important ingredient because it's used to provide virtual separation between the containers. This is how the processes inside a container don't interfere with the host or processes inside a different container on the same host. Here you can see the namespaces that were set up for a Postgres container that I have on my box. The C groups functionality is integral to constraining how much a container can use things like your CPU, memory, network bandwidth, etc. I can set these constraints by including options on the Docker run command when launching an image. Uh, here you can see that I've constrained the memory usage limit on one of my containers. Uh, there's an interesting uh, note about Java that I'll bring up in a bit about this particular subject. I want to quickly gloss over some file system details on this slide, um, where containers and images are actually stored on your file system. Uh, once you install Docker, uh, if you run the command docker info, that will spit out a bunch of information about your installation, including the Docker root directory. If you hadn't, haven't had a chance or haven't done it yet, um, go and explore your file system. This is definitely worth doing just so you know where you are and what's happening under the covers here. Um, so that Docker root directory, that's where most everything you're going to care about regarding your Docker images and containers, that's where it's going to be stored. Uh, one thing, if you're on a Mac, your containers are actually going to be running in a tiny VM. So you're going to need to use uh, a tool like Screen to get in there and get to the Docker root directory to look around. And if you're not familiar with how to use the Screen command, Definitely Google that, get familiar with it first. Uh, it will mess up your text display pretty good if you don't enter an exit screen in the right way. This slide shows how you can get information about the images that you have stored on your system. First, I listed my available images under the Docker images command. Uh, I actually have several installed, but I'm just showing the first couple in my list. Uh, for you to see. Using that uh, the docker inspect command, I can inspect any image I like using its image ID. This um, will spit out a ton of interesting information. 
Uh, what I want to highlight here, though, is this graph driver section, which contains to the paths. It contains the paths to the directories where all of the layers that belong to this image live. Uh, Docker, that's another term we need to learn here. Docker images are composed of layers, which represent instructions in the Docker file that was used to build the image originally. These layers actually translate into directories. These layers can be shared across images, and the point is to save space. The lower dir, merge dir, and upper dir sections, these are important to know. The lower dir directory contains all of the directories or layers that we just talked about that were used to build the original image. Um, these are read only, important to remember that. The upper dir directory contains all of the content that has been modified while the container is running. If, modif if modifications are needed for a read only layer in the lower dir section, then that layer is copied into the upper dir where it can be written to. This is called a copy on write operation. It's important to remember that the data in the upper dir is ephemeral data. It only lives as long as the container lives. In fact, if you have data that you intend to keep, you should utilize the volume features of Docker and mount a, a location that will stick around um, even after the container dies. This is how most containers running a database, for example, are run. Lastly, the merge dir. It's kind of like a virtual directory that combines everything from lower dir and upper dir. Uh, the way the union file system works is that any edited layers that were copied into upper dir from lower dir will overlay layers in the lower dir. Um, so the merge dir is actually when you when you log into a container, that's what you see. You see everything merged together. This slide shows, I actually have a few containers uh, currently running on my system. Two of them are my local JFrog container registry installation, which includes a container for Artifactory and a container for a Postgres database. The other is a simple test container that I was playing around with. Uh, note that the container IDs of these running containers match up with the container subdirectory names. Something to remember here is if you stop a container, that corresponding directory doesn't automatically go away until the container is actually removed with the docker remove command. So if you have stopped containers lying around that never get cleaned up, you might see your available space start to dwindle. There's a docker prune command that you can run that will help clean things up like this, or you can launch a container with a flag to indicate that it should be removed when it's finished running. Now, if you're using um, anything like any orchestration system like Kubernetes, um, there are ways in there that you can indicate that you want these containers cleaned up. All right, the tool sets around building and running images and containers have made things so easy that it is also easy to shoot yourself in the foot in a few places. And uh, here are a few of the most common gotchas, plus one JVM uh, Java specific gotcha that I ran into almost immediately when I first started working with containers. The first is running a containerized application as the root user. I'll be honest here, when I was initially getting containers up and running, I was so excited about how well it was working that it was a while before I took this one seriously. If you, now that you know that these processes that are running inside a container are just like any other process on the system, albeit a few constraints, it's scary now to run as root inside a container. Doing that opens up the possibility of a process escaping the intended confines of the container and gaining access to host resources. Um, it's a best practice to reduce your attack service. You do that with a container by following the principle of least privilege. Although containers are designed themselves not to affect other running containers, they can. If someone gains access to your container and immediately has root privileges, they can wreak havoc on your host 
which will affect everything running on your host, even other containers. So how do we mitigate this problem? The best thing to do is to create a user and use the user command inside the Docker file when the container is built in order to run processes as that user. There's a way to specify a user when running the, the Docker run command when you're launching a container, but that leaves open the possibility of forgetting to do that. So it's nice if the image is just uh, set up by default not to run as root. That said, pay attention to any of the official images that you pull from Docker Hub. Um, pay attention to whether they run as root by default and if they leave that step up to you. No constraints. So like I said, when I first started with uh, Docker and getting my stuff up and running, I, I left everything as default. Uh, it's the easiest thing to do to get something to work. It's the simplest thing that works. However, uh, even though Docker provides you with the ability to set resource limits on your container, it won't do that automatically for you. In fact, the default settings are uh, a free for all with no limits. So make sure you understand the resource needs of your application. Too little and your container will die from starvation, too much and the container could smother other things on the system. The resource usage of your containers is something that you're going to want to monitor over time and adjust as needed. It's a good way to determine if something is going wrong or if load on your system has changed for any reason. Never updating. We all get into this. At one point or another, you'll, if, especially as a developer, you're going to end up in a situation where you're just, you don't want to update. <laughs> it works the way it is. You just want to leave it alone. Um, but this is actually a really big security issue. Uh, it's easy to get complacent and not pay attention to what is actually getting pulled in when you're building your images. Not only do you need to be aware of outdated versions that you specify in your own Docker file, but you need to pay attention to what's in the base image that it's coming from. Not updating packages and libraries inside your container can lead to some pretty embarrassing results, especially when there are a lot of tools out there available now that will alert you when security issues have been discovered with specific artifacts. Um, obviously, we can't predict everything that's going to happen, but there are definitely, um, there's a lot of work going on out there to identify and make folks aware when a security issue is found. Um, even ensuring that you're running containers with a non-privileged user, uh, that has risk when there are known vulnerabilities that exist within your container or even on the kernel of the host. From time to time, exploits are found that enable um, attackers to potentially escape a container. So keep up with those security updates, uh, not only within your container, but on the host itself. Um, I've definitely been on teams where this has not been a priority, um, definitely because of the a fear of breaking the product or a service that's already working. Uh, but that is a symptom of other problems and probably worth an entire session uh, devoted to that. Um, trust me, it's much worse to leak private data or potentially be the start of a domino effect that can bring an entire system down. So take the time, um, get your backlog done and get those updates in there. This, this is pretty Java specific. I, I like this. Um, image because it's not something you expect. And uh, that can happen if you're trying to containerize a Java project without knowing some background. Um, this is definitely specific to Java applications. It's very much related to being aware of what your application requires to run successfully regarding memory. So remember earlier in our history lesson when I mentioned the dates for Java 7 and when Java 8 came out, uh, the JVM on its own is pretty clever at automatically determining the settings for your swap and heap and your garbage collection behavior uh, based on things like the memory and the number of cores available. But considering the timeline of Docker and Java releases, uh, Java 7 and 8 and certainly earlier versions are not fully container aware. <laughs> 
This means that your Java application won't necessarily obey the memory and CPU constraints that you put on your container. You may end up with some surprise out of memory killer activity. This reason for this is that the mechanisms that the JVM uses to retrieve the resources that are available for your application actually come from the host machine and not the C group limits that you would expect. There were some improvements around container awareness introduced in Java 8, update 131, remember that, um, and further improvements in later versions. But if at all possible, really try to get to Java 11. That's the latest available LTS release that is container aware. If you're, uh, like I said, I mean, a lot of the container stuff has been backported to later versions of Java 8. If you're stuck on Java 8, at least, you know, get to those later, later updates. Also, if you have no hope, um, you know, <laughs> it's not all lost. It's just that you won't be able to depend on the JVM to automatically determine the best use of resources for you. Um, you'll need to explicitly set the necessary flags for memory and the number of garbage collection threads uh, based on the limitations you want to set on your container. So we need tools to help manage our images. Um, JFrog Artifactory actually supports Docker registries and images. Um, you can use it just like you do for other types of artifacts. Um, both as a cache for third-party based images and as your own internal registry. After uploading your Docker images, you have the ability to gather statistics and even drill down into each layer of an image for more information. If you've integrated a CI-CD solution, you can also determine what build produced a particular image or what build used it. Um, why do I need this? Well, having a private registry is just as necessary as having a private repository for any of your other third-party dependencies. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is that just for the sake of your uh, development teams and for your build pipelines, you need to have these dependencies available to you in an environment that you control. Um, this is worth mentioning. Um, there are you know, the free public repositories that you may be pulling dependencies from. Uh, they have limits too. And in fact, Docker Hub is going to be changing um, some things around their user agreement beginning November 1st. If you haven't gone to look at that yet and you often pull stuff from Docker Hub, it's time to go take a look at that. Um, there's going to be some limitations on how often you can pull, how many times you can pull, and also some limitations on how long you can store an image. So uh, that's another reason to look into a, a private uh, repository of some kind so that you can at least cache things. I uh, encourage you to check these out. We discussed earlier the problems of not updating images regularly. Uh, this is um, X-Ray, JFrog X-Ray. Um, there's a few reasons that we, like why we care about image security. Um, the base images that your images are come from, that they come from and that you build from. Um, you really need to know your build. You need to know what dependencies are being pulled in and uh, what, you know, what versions of things mainly. Um, there are known vulnerabilities that you can protect yourself from. Um, also, X-Ray is pretty cool because it uh, monitors licensing as well. Uh, that's another thing that you may not be aware of when you're pulling in stuff from a base image make sure that those licenses are okay for your, you and your team and your company to be using. Um, X-Ray is a security scanning tool. It's also available in the JFrog platform. It will alert you if there are any known security vulnerabilities or, or licensing issues. Um, for Docker images, it's especially useful because it has the ability to drill down into each layer of the image to find out exactly what library or package has been flagged as a problem. So it'll even dig into your base images for you. You have control over how sensitive to make these alerts and what actions to take when they're triggered. All right, that is all I wanted to share with you. Um, I'll put up this link again for your swag and your chance to get um, Legos. <laughs>